This is a Talk Station original podcast. This is Christine Brin, and in this week's episode on Salty History, we will be talking with Keith Rittmaster from the North Carolina Maritime Museums and the Bonehenge Whale Center about some of the largest visitors to the Crystal Coast, the whales. We will be discussing the history of whaling, the different species of whales they targeted, and some of the ongoing threats and conservation efforts surrounding them. It all starts right now on Salty History. My name is Christine Brin, and I am an Associate Curator of Education at the North Carolina Maritime Museum in Beaufort, and today I have with me Keith Rittmaster. Hi, I'm Keith Rittmaster, Natural Science Curator of the North Carolina Maritime Museum and also the Director of the newly built Bonehenge Whale Center in Beaufort. When I first started working at the Maritime Museum about 14 years ago, Keith introduced me to the wonderful world of marine mammals through what he commonly refers to as a National Geographic Day. It was an absolutely beautiful day, and we went on a boat trip, and we saw more dolphins than we could count, and turtles, and ultimately had to ignore them because we were encountered two large whales. North Atlantic right whale and a humpback whale. Yes, and that was my introduction to the Crystal Coast and to the world of marine mammals here, and Definitely set the bar high at my expectations for what I would see after 14 years. I've not repeated that kind of a day. That I don't want anybody listening to think that's a typical day. But did you have any red letter days in your career? I don't think one that topped that. Poor Christine, you probably thought that was normal. No, that yeah. was unusual. But there have been um, some pretty unusual days. I, one was when uh, we were coming back from a dolphin photo ID survey and a humpback whale was absolutely exploding, lunge feeding through a school of Menhaden, right off Shackelford Banks. And our good volunteer, Paula Daly, captured it on her digital camera. And that was unusual. There are some unusual events, but most of our work is pretty uh, scientific. You know, we're not going after the thrills. We really want to try to identify the whales accurately and and identify the individuals Mm -hmm. accurately. And you've been, but I mean, you've been in the field for longer than 14 years. Right. I'd say for about most of the last 35, 38 years, my wife, Vicki Thayer, and I, and veterinarians and biologists, have been the North Carolina Marine Mammal Stranding Network. Mm-hmm. So we've gotten the calls of all the dead, dying, entangled, and sometimes healthy whales in North Carolina. Mm-hmm. Uh, so a lot of our work relates to responding to strandings, um, as well as going out and trying to photograph individuals to identify them through a process called photo identification. And when you refer to strandings, I do want to clarify, because I know that sometimes the public get confused by that, or beaching is the practice of whales when they are dying. They don't all do it, but occasionally they will bring themselves up onto the beach. Right, or can't help themselves. It seems like getting to the beach is not their first choice. I don't think they're trying to do that to survive. I think they're, generally, they're already dead. And if they're not, generally, they're dying. A lot of people think we are or have been a rescue organization, and we have successfully rescued a couple, but they're the I can't exception. think of one that has been like on the beach and rescued. They've been mm-hmm. still swimming or floating, and we've been able to identify a problem like entanglement and deal with it and have the tear-jerking, heartwarming feeling of watching it swim away. I mean, we keep trying, but generally, we, we do more euthanizing than we do rescuing yeah because once they come up either beached or stranded they're they're like you said not likely to be saved at that point right and Um, you're in in your time you're not seeing that being a high percentage now when you see these whales strand you're probably seeing a pretty wide variety not just one specific type of whale you just hit on the oh wow of my career Mm -hmm. and that's the incredible diversity of cetaceans that's a geeky taxonomic term that refers to whales dolphins and porpoises the incredible diversity that we've been able to document in north carolina 34 species of cetaceans this isn't competition i'm not bragging oh, i will work hard to prove me wrong but that's more than any other state i would say i brag about it all the time okay. we beat california <laughs> yeah, we beat california alaska hawaii that's the oh wow to me i don't want to lead people to believe go to North Carolina and see all these different whale species. Many of them are seasonal. Many of them are offshore. Some are just like, oh, we'll probably never see that again. What's Mm -hmm. an example? A white 
beaked dolphin swam into Beaufort Inlet and died on Sand Dollar Island. Well, I'm going to stop you right there because what you just said is probably going to surprise a lot of people. We're talking about whales and you mentioned a dolphin. Oh, thanks. <laughs> okay. um, so I do want to point out to people, dolphins are whales, right? Right. Yep. Tex- technically, taxonomically, <laughs> dolphins are small toothed whales. Mm-hmm. And another thing I would um, love to point out is what we see around here year round from our beaches, docks, and piers are bottlenose dolphins. I don't care if you correct the person next to you on the dock that says, oh, look at the porpoises, but I want you to know they are bottlenose dolphins. It's the only species that we're likely to see healthy year round from the beaches of North Carolina. I have never seen a live porpoise in North Carolina, and I've been looking. They generally range north of us, so I find dead ones occasionally. So when I study history of the area and we talk about the porpoise fishery in the area, we're not talking about them hunting porpoise. Right. I've looked at lots of photos from the porpoise fishery, and I mentioned porpoise fishery because that's how it's referred to in historical literature and even scientific literature, and they weren't porpoises and they aren't fish. All the photos I've examined were clearly bottlenose dolphins, but I think people refer to them as porpoises because to a lot of people around here, especially the fishers, when they say dolphin, they're talking about the mahi-mahi, the mm-hmm. dolphin fish, the dorado. Yes. So if they see the mammal, they'll often call it a porpoise. But I do want to emphasize that the harvesting of dolphins around here, they were bottlenose dolphins and not porpoises. And then this touches on a topic that we, we do discuss at the museum as well. So having such a strong variety and kind of so many whales off of our coast, one of the influences that we've seen, historically speaking, is that there was whaling or hunting of these creatures off of our coast. For over 300 years, we've seen hunting off of North Carolina's coast of whales, starting with first the New England whalers coming down and being off of our coast. And then we also saw some shore-based whaling. We have a lot of local families that have ties to the old whaling families. I think it was 1726 was the earliest documented whaling in North Carolina, and then from the shore-based whaling, I should say, from locals, and then it ended around 1916. So we do see that in our area, in our history. And we touched on one of the whales they were hunting was the, not porpoise, the dolphin. But there's two other whales that they would were targeting specifically off our coast. Right whales was the primary target uh, mm-hmm. by shore-based whalers. And then the New England ships you mentioned, and probably European ships, came to North Carolina waters, but way offshore around the continental shelf edge, 20 miles-ish offshore, um, to target sperm whales. But there's good evidence that they got other species as well, like humpbacks or right whales. Oh, yeah. They weren't passing up anybody, but I just was mentioning the three that they were kind of focusing in on. Yeah. Well, I do want to present the idea that what we're seeing now mm-hmm. in terms of ingesting plastic, entanglements, and ship strikes, these are whales that um are indiscriminately suffering long deaths because of the reasons I just stated, not from harpoons. And there's some bright folks making the case that what we are doing to whales on our East Coast, what we are seeing, might be worse for individual whales in terms of um, suffering and for the population than putting harpoons in them. The recent book by Michael Moore's uh, I was going to ask There's you to mention that. a masterpiece, and I mean, it's, it's called We Are All Whalers. And it presents the case that our Nikes from China, our seafood from Norway, and all the things we depend on that require shipping or net fishing is killing whales. And so we all have to sort of accept the fact that we're part of the problem mm-hmm. and part of the solution if we want to see these species recover. The book, I think, is really going to be a significant portion. But I like that. I find it interesting. I shouldn't say I like it. But I find it interesting, the statement you make about what we're doing to whales today with our trash and with the way we're treating the ocean is worse than what the whalers were doing 300 years ago. And what can we do today? I mean, obviously, recycling efforts are significant. Is there anything else you would recommend a visitor that is or a listener that might hear about that? might want to do obviously well, uh, recycling being more conscious about what they they're using but let's say they see a dolphin that's come up on the beach should they approach that dolphin or okay so there's a couple of questions there um what can they do i used to think that the buy local 
slogan was just an economic thing to help the economics in your community. And now I'm seeing it more as a saving whales thing. Mm -hmm. Because if I buy local, maybe I'm I'm contributing less to the demand for shipping. Mm Mm-hmm. Other things, you know, I'm just thinking, get rid of most of the lawns and plant a native tree and nurture it. The lack of trees we're all going to suffer for if we don't start replacing them. It doesn't sound like it relates to whales, but it certainly does in terms of carbon uptake and sequestration. Okay. And the dead dolphin on the beach comment, um, don't touch it and don't push it off unless you're instructed to by someone affiliated with the north carolina marine mammal stranding network Uh, there's a phone number to call there's uh, some web presence maybe we'll mention that number at the end of the podcast but uh i will mention the number now but i'll revisit it at the end okay this is so the the marine mammal stranding network is 252-241-5119 so i do want to, to make sure that that was mentioned a couple times as well because we all value the marine mammals in our area dolphins, the whales and such, and want to do what we can to keep them around for as long as possible. Yeah, what we've found is, um, I mean, to some of us, pushing a dolphin back on the water seems like a no-brainer, the right thing to do. But Mm -hmm. we've just found that they're suffering from something. You might push them off and feel good about it, but chances are they're going to come ashore somewhere else and may not be found. Mm -hmm. And if we could find a problem and fix it, or at least learn more about the carcass, or the cause of the stranding, that would contribute more to conservation than pushing Mm -hmm. an animal off and not really knowing why it's stranded. I hope that makes sense. It does. And what's also interesting to some extent, so I'm history-minded, so obviously I'm going to keep circling back to history. I'm sorry. I'm going to keep dragging you back (laughs) here. No, thanks. Um, So you have mentioned, and I think we've drawn the parallel before, that when a whale beaches itself in Carter County now, meaning stranding itself on the beach, you have a tendency to respond to it not too differently than they did 300 years ago, 200 years ago for shore-based whaling, where you bring out a crew of people and you're not harvesting the whale for its product, but more for its knowledge and edu- and things you can learn from it. And you have told me that you have found even that the historical tools have proven to be some of the most useful tools with the larger whales. Am I correct? Right. I've got great photos of, uh, I think it was a right whale at or near Fort Macon, the Mm -hmm. park staff gave me, of them peeling the blubber back with ropes and flensing tools. And yes, when we're doing a necropsy and taking off the blubber of a right whale. The necropsy being an autopsy on an animal. Thanks. Yeah. Well, we use um, similar tools and methods. In mm-hmm. fact, I wouldn't be surprised if one day I wanted to grab a whaling tool from the Maritime Museum yeah. or Bonehenge. Not, not a lance, but sort of a flensing tool. I think I might sharpen one up, actually. And then when you do your necropsies, you take a look at the animal and you get a better understanding for how they lived and why they died for a variety of reasons. But it's also given you some insight into a better understanding historically of the whaling industry because you've been able to harvest harvest some of the products they used to harvest from the whales to sell. Um, yes. Dolphin jaw oil is one that comes to mind. That's an oh wow to me. And, and I, I want to address that. But first oh, okay. I want to sh- uh, I just, a, just a shout out to North Carolina and all the collaborators who are contributing to what we're talking about. I think uh, UNC Wilmington, especially Ann Paps and Bill McClellan, they've been total leaders in this. Mm-hmm. Uh, my wife Vicki Thayer from CMAST, NC State's Marine Lab and Marine Fisheries, total leader leader in this work sometimes uh, people think that i'm the one who does all the necropsies i don't even do that well i'm the b team and then if they want to learn more about the work you and all the other professionals are doing they can visit the bonehenge website am i right right i think that's probably the best source where we're trying to put the photos and and the information on so bonehenge.org is that website Mm -hmm. which is spelled exactly like it sounds bone instead of stone Henge. Yes. Uh, silly play on words. Uh, late night inspiration. Bonehenge is the name. <laughs> <laughs> but circling back, so we were talking about the materials you have pulled from the whales to better understand them are not are often the same materials that the whalers were pulling for economic reasons. And one of those you've gotten a better understanding for is jaw oil from yes. dolphins. Uh, one time historian John Hare said, Keith, do you know what the most valuable product per ounce of the entire global whaling industry was? And I said, yeah, spermaceti. He said, no, 
Oh, and I think some of our viewers would have said ambergris. Yeah, ambergris, but that I don't think that was a product from the whaling industry because oh, that okay. was found floating and found on beaches. And during the whaling times, people weren't really sure about the source of it. Okay, um, I that count, makes sense. I'm going to count on a historian like you to correct me if I'm wrong. No, you are probably right. I just right. I know that a few of the visitors would have brought up ambergris because yeah, they commonly mention it. Anyway, John told me that the lower jaw, the mandible oil that's in the bottomless dolphin jaw, in North Carolina. So North Carolina's bottlenose dolphin lower jaw oil was the most valuable product per ounce. And I said, you're kidding. Like, why North Carolina? Why bottlenose dolphin? Why lower jaw? And he mentioned some reasons for these. But I had noticed over the years that often we approach a dead dolphin on the beach and there's a big wound near the lower jaw. People would often report it as a shotgun blast. And they'd say, this dolphin's been shot. No. Sometimes we've seen shark bites right on that lower jaw. Mm -hmm. You know, and it was just so curious to me. Are other animals targeting that jaw oil, which I think they are? Um, what was called a shotgun blast was actually uh, scavengers like birds and crabs going for that oil. And so something was special about it. And I got geeky one day and got oil from sperm whale head, oil from right whale blubber, humpback blubber, coconut oil, balanced dolphin jaw oil, jaw oil from other species. I put them all in a freezer. Even oil from the earth, crude oil, turns solid in a freezer. And all the other oils did except the lower jaw oil from North Carolina's bottomless dolphin. Huh. I know. That <laughs> is definitely that oh wow moment. Yeah, I couldn't believe it. And so... um. So that is definitely a selling feature, economically speaking, for an oil because... You want to keep things, you're using it in... Cold climates. Cold climates. You want something that's not going to seize up if you're putting it in... What would they put it in? Like cars? Sewing machines, sewing machines? guns, aeronautical equipment. Would it um, be in maybe like watches, like the gears inside Swiss watches? Swiss watches, apparently. I'm not the historian, but I've heard. <laughs> um, I've placed a high demand on North Carolina's bottlenose dolphin jaw oil. Like, who so, figures that out and how? Yeah, well, you have to some extent. Yeah, but, but I mean, someone long ago figured out that this jaw oil was the ideal material. Yeah, for it. right. And I think um, David Soselsky has written uh, extensively about it, so mm -hmm. he's taught me a lot about the harvests and the processing. And apparently, uh, they would cut the jaws out of the fresh dead dolphin, hang them on a line above a container, mm -hmm. and by morning there'd be a few ounces per side. In a container. Now, that sounds like not much for the life of a dolphin. And there were other products. But it was a lower jaw oil that was just so valuable. And I'm just wondering if they might have gone out and killed more dolphins for that valuable lower jaw oil rather than process the rest of those dead animals that they just killed. Now, we talked about what humans were using the oil for. But biologically speaking, why does the dolphin have oil in its lower jaw? <laughs> yeah, great question. Uh, I think uh, most people who studied whale acoustics agree that at least in toothed whales, of which bottlenose dolphins are included, most of their hearing are through the lower jaws. And I've heard biologists call that tissue in the lower jaw that's so infused with oil acoustic fat. It apparently transmits sound very well. Now, if sound is so important to these animals, you might wonder where the ears are because they don't have ears outside their heads. They don't have ear bones above the jaws like any mammal I can think of. The ear bones in a toothed whale are positioned right where those megaphones of a lower jaw oil open up. And experimentally, this was shown in captivity, I think by the Navy in the 60s, um, where they put a temporary lead shield across the lower jaw of a bottlenose dolphin. And it couldn't and, hear. And, and it could not find that object, penny or whatever, at the bottom of the pool to get its herring reward as easily as when that lead shield was removed. And that was like an, oh, wow. Like they're listening through their lower jaws. Mm -hmm. So a lot of that oil has probably many purposes, uh, storage of energy. So do all whale, do all, so we talked about there's toothed whales and then there's whales with baleen. But yeah, yeah, um, we about so that toothed whales are the one, do they all have oil in their lower jaw? As far as I know, yes. But I, dolphins I, are unique with their oil. It seems like it. Uh, okay. A Duke student came into Bonehenge. And she was really bright, asking great questions. And I, we had just installed a goose-beaked whale over at Duke Marine Lab. And she said, Keith, what about the jaw oil and goose-beaked whales? And I said, I don't know. I haven't tried yet. She said, let's do that. Mm -hmm. So I happened to have collected a bunch of the jaw oil. I mean, who would do that? Yeah. Um, from the goose-beaked whale when it stranded 
And so I put it in the freezer and it turned solid. Okay. So I couldn't believe it. You know, and, and so I just figured uh, jaw oil is jaw oil. But it's not. But it's not. So elementary school students all pretty much learn about, when they learn about whaling, that whales were hunted for their oil. But whale oil isn't whale oil. <laughs> because obviously the dolphin has unique jaw oil. It's not the same across species. And I'm going to change paths a little bit to whale oil because we talk about them getting oil from the blubber of whales. But sperm whales have a unique oil, too, that was hunted by the pelagic whalers off of our coast. Right. And you have, and you you kind of touched on that a little bit before, and you mentioned you had that oil, and it froze. It did solid at room temperature. Mm -hmm. So this is um, generally called spermaceti. It's from the head of a sperm whale, I think. And it's different from ambergris. Yeah, it's very, I've gotten yeah. people ask me if it's the same thing, and yeah, it's not. Yeah, so ambergris is something um, I think everyone agrees it's created in the digestive system of sperm whales. Mm -hmm. And when someone hands me a chunk of yuck and they claim it's ambergris, I generally am suspicious, and I look at it and smell it, and I ask Craig Harms over at the NC State Marine Lab if he will x-ray it because mm -hmm. I'm looking for squid beaks yeah. in that blob. And it had squid beaks, and I would suspect it came from the stomach of a, at least a toothed whale. Mm -hmm. I diverge. So, but going back to the oil. Sorry, that was my fault so, because um, I brought it up. Yeah. So the, the head oil, oil from sperm whales is spermaceti. Sperm whales just went on an evolutionary trajectory, and nothing followed it. It is by far the largest of the toothed whales. Nothing's even close to it in mm -hmm. its habits and its anatomy. It's and just old. to illustrate it, they get to be about six, the males of the species get to be about 60 to 70 feet long. Yes, they're by far the most sexually dimorphic males getting almost twice as big as females. And they have this huge reservoir of oil on the head uh, that was valuable for lots of things, brake fluid and everything, transmission fluid and Rolls Royces, cosmetics, mm -hmm. pharmaceuticals, photography. They would use it in a lamp. They probably wouldn't want to waste it, though. I think rich people probably use it in a lamp, and the smell of that would probably mean money. Yeah. You know, like, if I want to compress you because you're coming over to dinner, I'm not. I'm going to hide my blubber oil. I'm going to light my sperm whale lamp. That, yeah. That's my guess, but I count on you historians to teach me that. One thing's really hard to mm -hmm. tease out looking at the whaling logs and the historic literature is how much oil was in a whale, and what does whale oil mean? Because I read in a couple places that whalers would dilute the really valuable stuff like spermaceti with blubber oil. And, and that just made it hard to figure out the economics of it and, and the amount that was being harvested. I love the idea that you're using historical records from the whalers to help learn about the, his, the species itself. Because there's so much that we don't know about whales. Right. And you've had to get creative in a lot of ways in looking for resources. And I believe you've said like the whaling popu the whale population is still making a comeback from the days of whaling. Hard to say. I would say humpback whales in the North Atlantic Ocean where we are, um, mm -hmm. I think everyone agrees, are making a comeback. Well, I guess I not so much a comeback, but they're still suffering the effects from generations oh, of whaling. Right. Uh, lack of genetic diversity is, is, is plaguing right whales right now. I mean, mm -hmm. probably inbreeding and infertility on top of the ship strikes and entanglements. So... Yeah, that's a direct result of harvesting to the brink of extinction. We had one species that did go extinct from whaling. North Atlantic gray whale. That was it. I should yeah, I, I think that's well enough documented that it went extinct, presumably believe from whaling pressures um, in the 1700s. Mm -hmm. Before we sign off, now we mentioned the spermaceti oil. We mentioned the lower jaw oil. Now there's another type of whale. So the dolphin, the sperm whale, and then we had the right whale that was being hunted. What product were they pulling from the right whale? The most valuable product from right whales was the blubber oil. And that was the most abundant product. Right whales are unique in other ways. Right? In fact, they're unique in so many ways. They were called the right whale because they were the right whale to kill. Mm -hmm. Their baleen is really long. Now the baleen is what, so some whales have teeth, which we've discussed with sperm whales and dolphins, yeah. and some have baleen. Now, baleen is, what's the, oh, I can't it, remember the name. It's keratin, like keratin, our fingernails. Keratin, like our fingernails. I'm pointing at my fingernail. Yes. I'm doing the same thing as you, pointing at stuff. Uh, and it's in the upper jaws of baleen whales. Mm -hmm. uh, baleen. And it hangs kind of like big plates from there. Right. And it looks kind of whiskery. Yes. Uh, and, and it's in their mouth, and it's, and it's in the upper jaw, and they use that to filter out water and keep mm -hmm. fish in. 
And then so, hunter and whalers used to use it as kind of a form of plastic before plastic right, was plastic around. Right, plastic of the day. Uh, buggy whips, umbrella spreaders, corset stays, mm-hmm. brushes, lots of things for human uses. But the most valuable part from the right whale, well, their blubber was, is really thick. And because of that, they generally floated when they were killed. And that was another reason they had the right whale to kill. Big advantage to the whalers. Right. And they migrated close to shore, and their migrations were predictable. And we so we see that in our shore-based whaling here in North Carolina. Yeah, that was the shore-based target. Now, do you right whales. commonly see right whales coming up on the beach as part of the beaching conservation issue? Uh, yes. We treat it as an emergency every time, whether it's dead or alive. And lately, the last two right whales that came ashore in North Carolina were newborns. Now, are right whales the ones that are in the Carteret County Seal? Oh, fascinating comment. Yes. If you spend a day in Carteret County, you have seen Carteret County Seal, which features two right whales. I know they're right whales because they have smooth backs, no dorsal fins. Mm-hmm. And, and they my work. thing is sort of research and conservation and that has nothing to do with it. That county seal is all about economics back in the day well, and it's human probably, culture. I'd argue it's evolved. It, it started. Okay. Its original design was about the economics and such, but today I think it's more about our how we value them. As okay, well I hope but so. I could be. I mean, <laughs> yeah, well, being... I'd like to think that that's a more optimistic perspective. I try. Okay, <laughs> so before we finish off, I know we're over time already, but you got one last story for us about whales. I know we've touched on some of the sadder aspects of whales in our area, but I know you've you've seen dolphins playing. Okay, we call it playing, but I don't know if it really is. Okay, so one of the neatest things that I see maybe once a year, well, we call it jellyfish frisbee, but these dolphins don't throw these jellyfish back and forth. One dolphin will pick it up with its snout, lift it up and toss it in the air, and then chase it down and toss it again. So let me back up for a second. There's a species of jellyfish that occurs in our waters. Mm-hmm. I think I've seen it year-round, but mostly in the summer called cannonball jellies or jelly bombs. Stomolophus is the genus. And I've seen dolphins toss them. And on the Bonehenge website and some other places, there are pretty good photos of that. When I see that, I mean, you can't help but smile. But I, but I also wonder, like, why they're doing it. Yeah. It's, also, it's okay to think that it's just for fun. But if you ever see one of these jellyfish from shore or from your boat, you will notice that it's not just a jellyfish. It is a marine wildlife community because around and following the jellyfish are small fish and this jellyfish i've picked them up a lot i've never felt a sting from them and so when you pick one up and look inside the mantle you find more marine wildlife typically a fish or two and sometimes a spider crab. Never two spider crabs. I was going to say, I associate it with a spider crab. Yeah, right. Mm-hmm. But sometimes you don't find a spider crab. And so I'm just trying to figure out why the dolphins do that. And I'm imagining that maybe they're tossing them to have access to a prey item. Some, yeah, easy An appetizer snack. or something like that. But the truth is we don't really know oh, yeah. why they do it. It's just uh, it's a, it's a fun and funny interaction. Mm-hmm. Dolphins throwing jellyfish. So the thought that I want to leave everybody with is genuinely what a wonderful place North Carolina coast is. And that's definitely illustrated by our 34 whale, different species of whales that have been documented off our coast, which fun fact does include the orca, I believe, Keith. Am I right? Right. Living and working here, it can be easy to take for granted how amazing this place is. One of my favorite authors, Hans Christian Andersen, once said, the world is a series of miracles, but we are so used to them, we call them ordinary things. This is my personal invitation to you to take a closer look at these ordinary things, such as dolphins or whales, and see them for the miracles they are and how wonderful they are, and hopefully take some steps towards helping to save them and preserve them, maybe plant a tree in your yard that is a native species, as Keith mentioned. And I ask you, have you seen a whale off the North Carolina coast? I invite you to share your experiences virtually by commenting on this post or through the museum social media. Perhaps provide the museum or or perhaps visit the museum's website or the muse- or Bonehenge's website. The museum's website is ncmaritimemuseumbeaufort.com and Keith referenced the Bonehenge Whale Center's website, that is bonehenge.org as well. And once again, I do want to mention the Stranding Hotline we commented on earlier. That is 252-241-5119. And that's not just for dolphins, am I right? That's all 
marine all marine mammals. mammals and it includes seals and manatees as well mm -hmm. so if you see an animal that has beached itself definitely give that number a call and that is available on the bonehenge website as well so once again we are here from the north carolina maritime museum our website is ncmaritimemuseums.com and for more information about the bonehenge rail center you can visit bonehenge.org until next time we wish you fair winds and a following sea